Witches and witchcraft can be found in lore and legends the world over. Not to mention, they're a staple in our current horror and Halloween fiction as well. And all those things aside, the dark side of our own recorded history is full of accusations and inquisitions related to witchcraft, culminating in terrible events like the famous Salem Witch Trials in colonial America, or the massive Trier or Fulda Witch Trials in Germany, which led to the execution of hundreds of people. But without searching, how many witches of lore, legend, or fairy tale can you name off the top of your head? And what images come to your mind? For me, there's the Wicked Witch of the West from The Wizard of Oz, pretty much the cliché witch. There's also Maleficent of Sleeping Beauty, and maybe a little darker, the Blair Witch from The Blair Witch Project. But there is one witch in Slavic folklore that predates all of these, and has traits of all these witches as well. The infamous Baba Yaga. Baba Yaga is a nearly stereotypical witch when compared to modern representation of witches in film and in books, with sharp, jagged facial features, including the long pointed nose. She's often called Baba Yaga the Bony Legged due to her sharp, gaunt figure, and can be found quite often sprawled out across the stove in her hut. Her hut is, of course, magic, and in the middle of a dark forest surrounded by fencing made of human bones. The hut itself actually stands on chicken legs, which are able to carry it from one place to another, and in many stories, it's said to be almost always rotating and moving around. She doesn't fly around on a broom, though. She flies in a large mortar and steers it using the pestle. The broom is reserved for covering any tracks she leaves behind her, so that she can come and go in the dark without anyone being the wiser. So what's a mortar? Well, it's an old-timey small bowl and rod used to crush up spices. Hipsters are bringing them back. Maybe Baba Yaga used it to grind up bones when she wasn't flying around. But as in most cultures, witchcraft actually exists in a sort of gray area and is not necessarily good or evil. In many Native American cultures, witches are often medicine men who look after a whole village. But even in the Wizard of Oz, there's a good witch. So what kind of witch is Baba Yaga? We'll look at a few stories and see if we can find out. There once was a peasant man who married a peasant woman. They had two children, a boy and a girl. They all lived happily together until the peasant woman died. The peasant man was so grief-stricken, and he remained that way for several years. Realizing the toll his grief was taking on his life and the lives of his children, he eventually set out to remarry. Soon he found a new wife, and they became a new family. But all was not well. The new wife, the stepmother to his first children, was envious of and bitter towards the old man's older children. So one day, when the man was out, the stepmother conceived of the idea of sending the children off to the witch in the forest, believing that they would never return. She would lie to them and tell them they were going to visit her own mother, whose house stood on chicken legs in the middle of the forest. So the children set off, but being skeptical of their stepmother, decided to stop by their biological grandmother's house on the way out of town. Their grandmother was very, very old, and she knew immediately that it was Baba Yaga's house the stepmother wished them to visit. So she instructed them to be kind to everyone and everything. Do no wrong and speak no wrong, and kindness will be returned to you. She gave the children food for their journey, which included milk, some ham, and some cookies. So the children set off for the forest, and sure enough, found a house that stood on chicken legs. As they approached, they could see the old witch in her chair. Grandmother, they said, our stepmother has sent us here to serve you. Baba Yaga smiled and said, Russians. I'm not opposed to keeping you, but you must do what I say while I am gone, or I will eat you. Terrified, the children immediately set out to do their work. The little girl was ordered to spin yarn, and the boy was ordered to fill a bathtub using nothing but a sieve. The girl wept, as the yarn was difficult to make. Her sobbing attracted some mice, though, who said, 
Don't cry, little girl. Give us some food, and we'll help you. So the girl gave them some crumbs from the cookies her grandmother had given her. Thanks, they replied. Now go and find a black cat. If you give him some ham, he can help you escape this place. Meanwhile, the boy was mortified at the thought of being eaten. After all, how can you carry water in a sieve? He had almost given up when some sparrows saw him sobbing and said, Don't cry, boy. Give us some food and we'll help you. So he gave them some crumbs from his cookies. Try covering the sieve with clay, they said, and they flew off. The boy did just that, and he was ultimately able to get the bathtub filled. So Baba Yaga returned, looked around, and cackled. <laughs> All is as it should be, but tomorrow you have much more difficult tasks, and I think I'll be eating you before the day is done. Now get off to bed and out of my sight. But there were no beds, just a cold, dark corner. The sobbing kids were at a loss about what to do next. Then, the black cat that the mice had mentioned appeared. The girl, remembering the mice, gave the cat a slice of ham. Oh, pretty kitty, what do we have to do to escape this place? The cat answered, Since you have been kind and my master is cruel, I will help you. Take this magic towel and this magic comb. When you get the chance tomorrow, make a run for it. And when you hear Baba Yaga chasing you down, throw down the towel. It will turn into a river that will slow her down. And if she still catches up to you, throw down the comb, and a dark forest will come up out of the ground and hide you from her. The next morning, Baba Yaga woke them early, and demanded that the girl weave the yarn into a basket, and that the boy chop and stack an inordinate amount of firewood while she left for the day. Once Baba Yaga left, the children made their run for it. At first, Baba Yaga's dogs chased after them, but the children appeased the dogs with the last of the food their grandmother had given him, and the dogs let them pass. Then, the magic gates to Baba Yaga's land would not open, but the children oiled the rusty hinges, and the gates were grateful. The trees then tried to block them, nearly scratching their eyes out, but the girl tied ribbons she had in their branches, and they let them pass. When Baba Yaga returned early, she found the children were gone. Furious, she went after the cat and beat him. What have you done? She yelled. You are terrible, said the cat. And the children were kind to me, so they ran away. Next, she focused her fury on the dogs, who replied to her, You may be our master, but you never feed us. Then, when Baba Yaga got to the gates, the gates refused to open for her. She had to climb over them. Next, the trees began blocking Baba Yaga. This may be your land, they said, but you've never cared for us. Why should we help you? Realizing she was on her own, Baba Yaga set off in a fury after the children. Running, the children began to hear Baba Yaga approaching, and finally could see her across the field. So they threw down the towel, and a large river sprang up where the field had been. Baba Yaga was forced to run along the opposite shore as the river was too deep to cross. But eventually, she managed to find a shallow enough spot to cross, and began catching up. So then the children threw down the magic comb, and behind them sprang a thick, dark forest, and Baba Yaga, in a fit of anger, lost track of them. The children finally made it home, and their stepmother was stunned. The children told their father all that had happened, and he promptly kicked the mean stepmother out of the house, and they lived happily ever after. There's another similar version of this story, too. Several, in fact. But this one reminds me somewhat of the Cinderella story. The setup is basically the same as the previous story, except there's only one daughter. The father remarries a woman who has a daughter of her own, and when the father is not around, the stepmother and daughter are mean and cruel. The stepmother threatens to leave the father. But the father ultimately bows to her wishes and sets out with his daughter to find a place for her to stay. They happen upon a house in the woods that sits atop chicken feet. Baba Yaga, I have brought my daughter to be your servant, the father said as he bowed. Smiling, Baba Yaga agreed. 
and said that if the girl does well, she will be rewarded. Baba Yaga ordered the girl to spin a basket of yarn, keep a fire going, and have dinner prepared for her in the evening. The girl did all of this, but as she began cooking dinner, she began to cry at the thought of never going home. Hearing her, some mice came up to the counter and said, Don't cry. Give us some of your food and we'll help you. So the girl did, and the mice became her helpers. Baba Yaga returned that evening and was pleased with all that the girl had done. Now draw me a bath and wash me, she commanded. And when she was done, Baba Yaga rewarded her with several beautiful dresses. The next day was the same, and at the end of the day, the girl was rewarded yet again. This went on for some time. Eventually, the girl's father began to miss his daughter. So he told his wife that he was going to go visit her. And the stepmother secretly hoped that the girl was dead or gone. When the father arrived at Baba Yaga's house, he was stunned to see that his daughter had done very well for herself and was in fact now quite wealthy and content. Excited about her luck, he wanted to bring her home, and Baba Yaga agreed. When they approached the town, their dog started barking excitedly at the return of his long-lost companion. The mean stepmother smacked the dog, and in her mind expected nothing other than a bucket of bones. But she was, of course, wrong. Her stepdaughter arrived, with her father, looking clean, well-nourished, and very well-dressed. Envious of this outcome, the stepmother demanded that her own biological daughter be taken to the Baba Yaga next, to which the husband reluctantly agreed. When the girl arrived at Baba Yaga's, she was put off by the odd house and the cruel-looking witch, and beside herself with jealousy and greed towards her sibling. When Baba Yaga ordered her to do chores, the girl did so full of spite, and when the mice offered to help, she swung at them with a rolling pin. And when Baba Yaga returned that night, she found the chores only half done and a bitter girl in her house. So she broke her into pieces and stuffed her in a bucket. When the day came for the girl to return home, her mother sat outside gleefully awaiting her newly enriched daughter. But the dogs did not share in the excitement. All her husband came home with was a bucket of bones. So in these stories about Baba Yaga, we see the witch is indeed terrifying, but that one way or another, kindness and patience is rewarded, even in the face of that terror. And even more Baba Yaga stories, some which I'll link to in the episode description at loreandlegends.net, we see people come to her in times of need, whether it's for a horse, a wife, or a magical request. And the greater the person's wish, the greater the demands of Baba Yaga, and the higher the stakes. And in many cases, it's a stake that you might end up on. One popular mention of Baba Yaga comes in the movie John Wick, as the Russian crime boss reflects on the circumstances that sent John Wick on his rampage. He begins to refer to John Wick as the Baba Yaga. It's fitting in some sense, because like Wick, Baba Yaga is living by herself in the middle of the forest. But when provoked or mistreated, her vengeance can be fierce and unrelenting. But do well, and at worst, you'll be left alone. So I think we can put Baba Yaga in that sort of dark gray area. She reminds me of figures like Krampus, or maybe the Boogeyman. Her stories serve to promote a sense of caution, and a moral guidance to do the righteous thing at all costs. Because for the ones who don't, or the ones who put others in harm's way, well, they ultimately pay the price. Be sure to check out the episode description and visit loreandlegends.net for some more notes on this topic and some links to other content related to it you might like. And if you could do me a favor and leave me a five-star review wherever you listen, that'd be amazing. You can also follow me on facebook.com slash Legends or on Twitter where my handle is at Obi Wade. Also, I brought back the YouTube channel. So if you'd rather watch the videos or let the video play in the background and see some of the art I attach to it, check that out. Just search for Lauren Legends on YouTube. That's all for this episode. See you next time.
The music in this episode. The Complex by Kevin McLeod at Incompetech.com. Licensed under Creative Commons by Attribution 4.0. Visit creativecommons.org for more. Shadowlands 7 Codex by Kevin McLeod, also available at Incompetech.com. Licensed under Creative Commons by Attribution 4.0. Witch Hunt, also by Kevin McLeod, available at Incompetech.com. Licensed under Creative Commons by Attribution 4.0. Visit http semicolon backslash backslash creativecommons.org slash licenses slash by slash 4.0 for more information.